Okay, everyone, so now we're going to get into something that most people do know about, European art and architecture. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what it was like beforehand and kind of the significance of it, and it's real simple. Art and architecture are a part of pretty much every human type of civilization that we've ever had. So... It clearly is important to us, and this idea of expressing oneself outside of, you know, your own body. Um, so, let, let's get into it here, okay? So, what was it like before the Renaissance? We have a time period that we call Gothic Art and Architecture, and basically, uh, there was some painting. It tended not to be realistic. Uh, there was no real proportion involved. Uh, it tended to mostly focus on religion. A couple other things that weren't religious, I'll show you one, but it was really just religious. Um, architecture was very, very grand. In some cases, it took years to build the buildings, although some cases they could be bulky, imposing, very expensive as well. And then there were illuminated manuscripts, were absolutely beautiful, and they were ways that knowledge was preserved, and these were often done by priests and monks. Uh, they are very beautiful, they're very intricate, and I'll show you some. So let, let's look at here. Like, here's an example of a Gothic painting. This is, actually comes out of a book, and as you can see, um, there's no real background, there's no proportion. Like, look at the size of this guy's leg, or is this the guy's leg? Uh, like, I'm not even sure. I don't even know where the green horse came from. Um, you look at the size of this dude's arm. Okay, the arm looks like if he, if he stretched it out, would be bigger than the sword. No facial expressions, no sense of depth. Yeah, this is basically what we got going on here. Um, here is so something a little bit better. We see this is a picture, I believe this is of St. John writing his, um, his gospel here. Now, this is a little bit good. Now, the background's not quite as good. I don't know what this guy's going on over here. Some facial expression, not too good with the shadows. Um, but, you know, you would see the folds in in clothing like that. So this is a little bit later in the Gothic period, so we're getting a little bit better. Um, here's a great example of an illuminated manuscript. These pictures, the beautiful lettering, all done by hand. I mean, would take years and years to do. Really, really beautiful, beautiful items. Um, and then let's look at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, France. This is your example of, um, you know, this is your Gothic architecture. Giant churches, they're very large. Um, they had to be kept up because they weighed so much they could collapse in on themselves. So they created this thing called a flying buttress, which would distribute the weight out. So you wouldn't have this problem. Um, and then you had your gargoyles, which were built to protect the churches. Um, this would be the nave. This is the central area of the church. Very, very large. You can see these giant, these are actually called groin vaults. Um, this goes back to the Roman time period. But you can see, I mean, the whole idea here is we're building a house of God. And oh my goodness, this is a house of God. Um, we can see the stained glass, also very beautiful, very intricate. Um, but probably the, the pinnacle example of all this was the uh, Cathedral of Our Lady of Chartres which was in Chartres, France. And I'm pretty sure I'm saying that wrong, but uh, to give you an idea how big this is, if you look at the mouse, hey, I'm over here. Um, I got to visit this church. Uh, some of the pictures are mine. And I was standing way back here. So this is about a block away from the church. And I was not able to get the tops of the towers. That's how big this, this church is. Um, as you can see, when you enter, these are called portals. You would have these very elaborate um, relief sculptures of biblical stories. It's really, really cool. As you can see here, this is kind of an old school gargoyle that's also um, like a downspout to keep water away from it. Um, you can see all these intricate carvings here. Um, really quite beautiful when you go in. I mean, just a massive chair. I mean, these chairs sit hundreds of people, and you have all this room back here. Um, this giant window, which is also incredible. And the cool thing about this church is that supposedly it houses the Veil of Mary. That is my picture there. A little bit of a flash. I'm sorry. Um, this supposedly was a veil worn by Mary. We cannot verify that. 
historically, although it is from the time period. It was brought back to this area by the mother of Constantine. Um, and it is really cool, you know, when you go back into the area, I'm not going to lie, like, the, the church definitely feels a little bit different. So that's kind of the Gothic area. And so what is Renaissance art all about? Again, we have rebirth. We have the study of, of humanism. But what is most important here is the development of the patron system. The fact of the matter is, is for one of the first times in history, as an artist, that is actually your job. Okay. Um, and it really was because, especially in Italy, the in thing to do was for the wealthy people to pay for art and to commission artists to do a variety of works, whether it's painting, whether it's sculpture, whether it's building a building. Towns would also pay these artists for stuff. And more importantly, the church would also patron a lot of people for it. Now, that's going to cause a problem in the future. We'll get there. But you have to have, you had to have the patron system, okay? Um, also, you happen to get a series of just incredible artists. I mean, guys that were able to go to art schools, that's going to be a big deal. There were schools that you could go to art with or art for, but talent, like, I, you can't deny it. You know, when, when you get a bunch of talent, you tend to have good things happen. And then you have just the the increased bettering of, of style and techniques. Um, being able to paint with a lot more realism instead of being kind of fanciful, trying to really depict people how they truly are with flaws, which is important. Um, the use of perspective or a vanishing point, how things in the painting that are closer up are bigger, things that are further back are not only smaller, but they're a little fuzzy, right? As we look far away, things aren't quite as clear. Okay, uh, bright colors and and pastel colors and then deep colors and and all sorts of different colors that hadn't really been used in quite a long time and then most importantly is a uh, cheer chiaro scuro gosh i said that terribly oh, that's all right which was the play of light and shadow if you look at anybody if you look at anything there's always some type of shadow and that's what makes it real and that's what these guys are able to do um, one of the first big guys out was Filippo Brunelleschi. He is a architect, and he is going to build the first big dome of the Renaissance. And actually, you hadn't had a dome for like twelve or thirteen hundred years since the Pantheon had been built in Rome. As you can see, here's the outside of it, and here's the inside. It was absolutely beautiful. And he went to Rome a lot, and he looked at the Pantheon, and he was trying to figure out how to build it and what type of proportion you could build it in and what he discovered was that um if i pop back here he realized that a dome reminded him of an egg and that if you took an egg and cut the bottom off you actually have a dome and so he used an egg to develop the proportion of a dome and it was absolutely gorgeous um michelangelo would build a dome that would be larger than this this is about 120 feet across so you can see at the top here there's a bunch of people so this gives you an idea of how big the dome was um and this, I believe, was the second largest dome in the world when it was built. Um, Michelangelo's would be built or would be sorry would be built bigger, but this would always be seen as kind of like this is the the, the breakthrough. Um, another early guy that was really big on sculpture was Lorenzo Ghiberti. Um, here are two of his works: the Sacrifice of Isaac and the Florence Baptistry doors. These doors are made of bronze; they're huge. Um, but this idea of the intricacy of what is called relief sculpture. Relief sculpture is when you carve a sculpture into something, okay? And this is actually a piece that he did. Um, the the people who, the, the church, made a contest to see who could build the doors. And so you had to do a relief sculpture in order to get the contract. So the sacrifice of Isaac was done as a contest to get the doors. The doors on the, the side over here, to give you an idea how big these are, like I would be about here. Okay, I think the first three are about six feet tall. I'm a shade under six feet. Um, but you can see, look at the detail. Look, I mean, the, this guy was able to figure out how to get shadows to play in sculpting bronze. Okay. Um, you can see the detail of the musculature of, of Isaac and the angel that came in, just absolutely gorgeous. And this had never really been done before. And so why are these guys are really important? Uh, Brunelleschi was really big on advances in architecture, but he also really worked in his painting on 
perspective. And he was the guy that really brought that idea of a vanishing point of what's called one point perspective into art again and incredibly transformative. And then Gimberti, not only did he really take you know, uh, sculpture to the next level. He also opened a school where a lot of artists could go. Um, the big sculptor early on that really made sculpture popular was Donatello. His full name is Donato di Niccolo di Bettobardo. Um, on the left is his statue of David. Now, why is this significant? Well, one, it's nude, okay? This was a big deal back then. People didn't do that. Okay, so the fact that you had a nude sculpture, and again, it wasn't nude to necessarily be super evocative, but it was to show the human form. That was the whole idea. And what was really done well here is that what these guys are able to do with their sculpture is that you could see David here is a young man. He's not necessarily completely ripped and shredded. I mean, the guy's in good shape, but he looks young. When David fought Goliath, he was a young man. Uh, and you can see Goliath's head that he's standing on here. But you see the little... The little his posture, he's got a little attitude, he's got a little little fire there, and that's something that David was said to have through the Bible. So it was really impactful, and it really could show what you could do, and that freestanding sculpture could be done again, and it was something that these guys would really push themselves to do. Uh, this is in the Museo Nazionale di Bargello in Florence, and here's another big one, this idea of... Um, large sculptures that are done to honor someone. Now, this is an equestrian sculpture, of course, a guy on a horse. This was done by, uh, this was to honor a man by the name of Erasmo of Narni, whose nickname was the Honeyed Cat. Fantastic. Uh, this is in the city of Padua, and this is bringing back an old Roman uh, ideal. Look, we see the pigeon just hanging. But this idea of, again, of honoring people, and people would pay for sculptures of loved ones or pay for sculptures of someone that's important. The other big guy is Raphael. Raphael, uh, this is his school of Athens. Raphael um, did this work called the Stella della Segnatura, which was the room of the signatures. He actually painted four walls in the room, but this is his, his most famous work. The reason I like to show this picture is one, look at the perspective. Look, look, it goes straight back all the way to here. Okay. And the idea was that what he was trying to do was blend or, or show what the Renaissance was all about. We're taking all this old knowledge and we're bringing it forward, right? So the Stella della Signatura was a picture of all these ancient philosophers and scientists and stuff like that. Um, you know, you've got like Socrates and Plato, and then you got guys with orbs over here. Um, you know, uh, you, you've got Euclid, who's, I think Euclid's over here. Um, all these really famous ancient guys, but he, he painted them with the faces of guys that he knew. So it was like modern people depicted as their ancient brethren, if you will. Um, so, yes, this is Socrates, but Socrates looks like Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, here is Michelangelo down here looking all mad. They actually had the equivalent of, like, a media Twitter war. Um, they kind of hated each other. Like, Michelangelo really, really hated him, and it was crazy. They would, like, bash each other in the press. It was, it was intense. He also put himself in the picture right here, if you look at the mouse, like, right over there, just peeking out. But really, this, this was this great blending of the culture that was going on at the time. And this is another part of the room as well, just to give you an idea of kind of the fullness of what was going on. Okay, uh, and this was the same thing. Uh, this was uh, the, the religious aspect of it. You have all these saints. Then down here were more modern holy men um, debating the divinity of God and stuff like that. And it was really, really impressive. Um, but then other guys, so it wasn't all Italians. Other guys would go in a different direction. Jan van Eyck, he's really impressive because what this guy was doing is depicting regular people. Okay, Jan van Eyck, look, it's a, it's a man with his pregnant wife, their little dog. What's really cool, I think, is like back here in the picture, it's curved and you can see their back. You know, I just want that fantastic hat. Maybe I'll wear something like this around school one day. But that's what also the, the Renaissance is all about. It's about this high, great, and some, this incredible thing. But at the same time, we want to show what regular people are like. You know, they live in basically the equivalent of a studio apartment. Like they have a table over here. They have a little couch over here. Their bed's in the same room because they're regular people. And this had never really been done before. 
Now, the big guy that a lot of people know of Leonardo da Vinci, um, I'm not going to get too much into his background. You know, his parents split when he was young. Um, his father recognized his skill, gave him to, to school. Um, he had a variety of controversies in his life. A lot of them had him getting banished due to homosexuality. Back then, unfortunately, was not really accepted. Still issues, of course, today. Um, but uh, he often would have to move from place to place because of that, eventually ending up in uh, France where he would, would die. One of his also issues is that he often would not finish his work. Uh, we have tons and tons of manuscripts, yet he never actually finished any of them. He had many finished, unfinished paintings, but his skill and technique and his subtlety would really be his influence. Okay, and of course, here's The Last Supper. The reason why Leonardo da Vinci is so different and interesting is that what he would do is he would take some of these commonly known things, but 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 pick a moment to paint. So, for instance, The Last Supper is painted, and the, the topic is when Jesus told his disciples that someone would betray him. And then every single one of these people have a different, all the apostles have a different look. Okay, some are shocked. Some are like, what are you saying? These guys are like, what is he talking about? This person is like, oh, no. Like, it, it's really, really creative. And he was so good at just those subtle, subtle things. It, it, it's so, so impressive. And, of course, you have the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is one of the most technically advanced paintings that we had ever seen. Is she smiling? Is she not smiling? You can see the thoughts. Um, this was painted for a person, Madonna Elisabetta. Um, you know, we see the, the kind of hazy background here. It really is a fascinating picture. What's really cool about the Mona Lisa, and I did this, like, no matter what angle you take her at, she's always looking around you, so, like, move your head at... Um, she was able to do that. This is actually uh, where we got the idea for the um, Uncle Sam poster uh, that the U.S. Army wants you and your Uncle Sam is pointing at you. And no matter what angle you look at that poster, Uncle Sam is always pointing directly at you. Wrong. Let's go back. That wasn't the first time. We go back all the way to Da Vinci. Now, Da Vinci also had a lot of ideas. Um, but here's the issue. Look, you see him. Um, he had some discussion about how children um, grow in the womb. This down here was a helicopter. This over here was a machine gun. Here was some wings. Here was a parachute. The problem with Leo, and this is why I say he's a little bit overrated. That's right. I went there. He's overrated. He's an incredible artist. I can't do what he does. But his influence isn't as large as what we think, and here is why. He doesn't publish anything. He doesn't show anything. In fact, much of his writing was written in code and in mirror writing. So it was written backwards and upside down. Like So you had to look, kind of look at it through a mirror, and then you had to decipher a code, which he didn't really give to anyone. And so those types of things didn't really directly lead to anything. It shows that the man himself was a genius and incredible, but he didn't quite impact this as much as people want to think. The greatest art of artist of all time is Michelangelo Buonarroti. That's right, I said that. And I will argue tooth and nail over everyone. Period. He was a sculptor. He was a painter. And he was an architect. He is from Urbino. Um, his dad wanted to go into law, but Michelangelo didn't want it. They eventually would let him go. He went to art school, which was really, really important. Um, where he caught the eye of the de' Medici family, who commissioned him to do a lot of things. Um, he also studied anatomy. He, uh, again, his career as a painter, sculptor, architect. He actually didn't see himself as a painter. He did not like to paint. Um, in fact, the story goes, you know, we all know or should know that he painted the Sistine Ceiling, which I'll show you in a second, but the Pope that commissioned him to do it, Julius II, actually had to threaten to excommunicate him because Michelangelo refused to do it. It, it. It's as crazy as you would think. So let's look at some of the things. Here is his dome in St. Peter's at the Vatican. It is absolutely gorgeous. Look at it from the inside. This was much larger than, than um, Brunelleschi's was, but still, I mean, so, so we just start with just that. Okay, then we go to the Sistine Chapel. I mean, 
It took him four and a half years to paint it. He got about a third of the way done and felt it was crap, so he ripped it down. He had some helpers, then he fired all of them because they weren't good enough. This depicts a variety of larger-than-life scenes of the Bible. He had to paint it on his back by candlelight, and it's a fresco. What's a fresco? That means you have this thin layer of plaster that you paint into, so if you don't get it done in time, it hardens and then it's ruined. I mean, just look at the detail here. It, it's it's mind-boggling. Okay, this is the most famous one, God creating Adam. You know, they're touching, almost touching the fingers there. But you look at the detail. I mean, this looks almost like a picture of this young woman down here. It is absolutely remarkable. You look at the light, you look at the shadow of, of what they were able, or what Michelangelo was able to do here. It, it, it's unrivaled. Oh, wait, and then he's a sculptor. Um, here is David. Now, what's David is really impressive is because he wanted David to be impressive yet have flaws, right? So according to, like, ancient Greek standards, you know, he made the nose a little bit too big. He's made his hands super huge. Look how big his hands are. Okay, the legs were slightly different lengths. There were all these little things in here that made David kind of seem like a regular guy, okay, which we had never really seen before. But the end-all and be-all is probably what many people think is the greatest single sculpture ever created, and you could argue a bunch of different ones, which is the Pieta. A Pieta is a scene of Mary holding her dead son, Jesus. And there are so many different things going on here. I mean, he looks dead. You look at the, 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 the interesting look on her face. Um, look at all, I mean, this was one piece of marble, guys. Look at all, all the, the folds in the clothing, which of course create shadows, which make it even more real. Um, she seems to have this ability to hold up her son, even though he should be like heavier than her. Um, but he paints her as very beautiful. Note he paints her as much younger than, almost looking younger than her son. But remember, according to the scripture, I mean, Mary would have been an early... 50s, I don't know, I forget how, how old Mary would have been, Jesus, 33, yeah, she would have been in her early 50s at that point, but, so if you look at her early 50s, if you just do a math, but that is not the face of a woman who is 50-some years old, but that doesn't matter, she's Mary, and she is beautiful, and she is this, this end-all, be-all of the church, and, and, and with Michelangelo, we reach, like, the pinnacle, okay, this is the top of the top of how good these artists could could be. And it would continue on, okay, and, and we're going to get into the Baroque period next, but art and architecture would change. It becomes something that we focus on. It becomes something that is that is really an indelible part of our culture and, and impressive nonetheless, okay? And we'll continue to talk about this in class, and I'll see you guys there.